Good afternoon and welcome to the Editor's Podcast for the Journal of the Academy of Nutrition and Dietetics. I am Dr. Linda Snetzelar, Editor-in-Chief of the Journal. This particular podcast focuses on an article in the journal titled, Patient Malnutrition Risk or Number of Initial Nutrition Intervention Categories Can Be Utilized to Develop Registered Dietitian Nutritionist Staffing Models in the Inpatient Adult and Pediatric Hospital Setting. And with me today, I have Dr. Allison Stiber, PhD, RDN, who is the Chief Mission Impact and Strategy Officer for the Academy of Nutrition and Dietetics, and Dr. Rosa Hand, PhD, RDN, who is an Associate Professor in the Department of Nutrition, Director of Medical Student Research and Scholarship in the School of Medicine at Case Western Reserve University. Welcome to both of you. Thank you, Linda. Pleasure to be here. To enhance the article that you published, I want to welcome your thoughts on some of the questions that focus on the concept of malnutrition and registered dietitian nutritionist staffing models. Your article focuses on care time and emergency visits within 90 days of hospital discharge. Why is this topic of importance to RDN staffing models? Thanks, Linda. So I think people might be surprised that we looked at emergency department visits because this is a more distal outcome than we often look at in nutrition studies and certainly um, more distal than we've looked at at staffing studies in the past. But this makes the results of broader interest. So emergency department visits are something that patients and administrators both care deeply about, and they are relatively easy to extract from the medical record. And so those are two reasons why we chose emergency department visits as the major outcome of this study. We have reason to believe that nutrition makes an impact on emergency department visits post-discharge. So the question we are asking here is, can we directly connect that to the time that's spent by the dietitian? Of course, this is a complicated relationship with a lot of of confounding variables in terms of the patient's characteristics, their uh, the course of their hospital stay, um, their access to medical care outside the emergency department, as well as their nutrition status. However, in an ideal situation, we, what we would like to see is that more time with a dietitian or perhaps a particular amount of time with a dietitian would lead to fewer emergency department visits after that hospitalization. However, that's not the relationship that we found. We found that more time with a dietitian was associated with a higher incidence of emergency department visits subsequently, which suggests that despite our best efforts, we did not control for all of the confounding and all of the complexity of that relationship. So I think if emergency department visits continue to be used as the outcome of staffing studies, um, even more work will have to be undertaken to make sure that there's a um, direct relationship between the, the staffing predictor and the emergency department visit outcome. I believe that this is such an important issue as we look at staffing models. And, you know, certainly it's very timely. But in addition, um, I think your way of looking at this, too, is is very unique, very novel. And so that's important to, uh, as well. My, my second question, then, is your study looked at patient characteristics relative to malnutrition risk. What did your findings show? Thank you, Linda. So um, this study was designed to do two main things. One related to malnutrition, looking at screening of malnutrition, and then further diagnosis of malnutrition. And that was the, the first aim. And the second aim was this um, understanding of staffing and staffing requirements. And so we had all this information on malnutrition screening for both the adult population and the pediatric population. For the adult population, we used 
malnutrition screening tool, and about 55, 56% of the individuals were screened at risk, which is exactly what we, we expected in the, in, the, in the study because we designed it um, to be able to look at those with risk and those without. And in the pediatric population, though, it was a bit different. So almost 90% of the kids enrolled in the study had either medium or moderate or high risk for malnutrition. And we used the strong kids tool for that, which is a very well validated um, tool for malnutrition. We could see that um, being at risk for malnutrition, whether it was in the adult population or the pediatric population, significantly increased the estimated total of um, registered dietitian time. And, and in the adult population, it increased it by 7.5% um, for the over those who had no risk. And in the pediatric population, depending on whether it was moderate or high, it had either a 20.5% increase or a 31% increase. Um, so while we didn't um, break down the, the actual demographics specifically between those with risk and those without, I think the key point here is that being at risk for malnutrition um, was significantly associated with taking more of the dietitian's time. And this is very much in alignment with things that we have seen in other studies that have been done both in the United States and outside. It's certainly very much showing the importance of the RDN, so yeah, extremely important data. And then my next question, what are three takeaway messages from your study results? So I, I'll jump in here and then maybe Rosa and I can tag team a bit. You know, some of the things that I thought were quite interesting is that um, that the approach that this paper in particular uses is a little bit different than some of the approaches by previous staffing studies in the sense that it forecasts staffing needs over a long period of time. Um, so you use that 90 day um, mark where we looked at ER visits and readmission rates. And um, because of that, we are able to forecast a little bit longer than cross-sectional staffing studies that haven't been able to do that. And so in my mind, I think this is a strength of this study that uh, the approach really does give it kind of a, a good forecast for clinical nutrition managers to use as they're developing their staffing needs. Um, and I also think that uh, another interesting takeaway for, for me was that the um, when you compare to other staffing studies, the amount of time that dietitians are taking for that initial visit was longer, substantially longer in this study than compared to other studies that even that we ourselves have done. Rosa um, led one that we've published in the Journal um, of the Academy of Nutrition and Dietetics in 2015. And, and compared to those times, even the times in this study recorded were much longer. And there are probably multiple reasons relating to methods and other things of why that's true. But I think it may also indicate how dietitians are practicing now. And maybe um, that is an important factor in consideration for clinical nutrition managers to note that. I'm glad you um, started first, Allison. I think my takeaways are maybe a little bit um, even bigger picture. So one um, takeaway for me is the difference between the adult time and the pediatric time. And I think this is particularly important as we see um, pediatric hospitals closing and maybe more kids being taken care of in adult environments, needing to figure out how we can appropriately staff hospitals so that they can take care of these populations that have fairly different nutrition needs and, and different timing, I think is an important question. On some of those bigger picture topics, you know, I think this study demonstrates again that dietitian staffing is a complex topic that is wildly understudied. And so we need lots more research published in this area. But I think we can also learn a lot from individual facilities and what they're doing with staffing and what their um, quality improvements are. So I hope that people will um, be inspired to think about how they can disseminate the staffing work that they're doing in their own facilities to help the whole profession learn from each other. And sort of on that topic, um, I think the, the one of the complexities around staffing is that 
we are not totally standardized in the definitions that we use when we're talking about um, some of the characteristics of time. And so when you're reading a staffing paper or when you're thinking about designing a staffing study or using these results yourself, I just want to encourage people to be really clear on what the definitions are for the the variables that are being studied. So for example, um, understanding what's included in direct versus indirect care time or understanding that in this paper we were um, counting all of the time <clears throat> for any hospitalization within 90 days whereas in other cross-sectional studies the time reported was for individual patient encounters and so those differences can make the the results wildly different and it's important um, for people to to really delve into the methods and and understanding those definitions in order to accurately implement these results yeah and if, if it's all right I, I would like to just pop, um, pile on just a little bit more about that i had this thought as rosa was speaking you know when we talk about the length of time i mentioned one of the takeaways is that care time was longer in this study than others and certainly for the pediatric as rosa pointed out this is a really important consideration and when we think about definitions you know the strong kids tool is a a, a much more complex tool than an average screening tool. And in fact, I think we could even question whether it's really a screening tool or more likely a diagnostic, diagnostic tool because it, it takes longer to conduct and it has more parameters involved in it. And so, you know, again, thinking about those definitions and making sure we are we describe them in our standard in the way we think about them, because I, I do think that that could contribute to the longer time of care as well. Yes, thank you. Thank you both. I, I think this research is so important from that longitudinal element that you talk about, the 90 days, but then also the timing and um, the differences um, between adult and pediatric groups is so important. And I think then also that concept of the topic and the associated definitions is is incredibly important. And, and these are all elements that are so important in terms of the research that you've done. Um, finally, then, how might an RDN working in a hospital setting use your study results? Yeah, thanks, Linda. So I hope that people will use these results because we, um, from the beginning, wanted this study and, and the outcomes of it to be practical. And so to that end, um, table four in the publication is an example of exactly how somebody would uh, use these results to predict the amount of dietitian time that their facility would need. So the first thing to understand is that um, a dietitian or clinical manager or whoever is wanting to apply this data at their facility, you do have to do uh, a little bit of data collection to sort of customize um, the, the results. And so there's two things you need to collect. The first one is you need to establish a baseline number of minutes to provide care for the the hospitalization for a patient who needs nutrition care but is not at malnutrition risk. So I think um, that can be a little bit confusing to people. Why did why do we have all these patients who screened, you know, not at risk for MST but still needed nutrition care? So remember that's all the people who need things like education for their diabetes or um, you know, they need some other kind of care from us besides malnutrition care. So we need to establish at your facility an average number of minutes over that person's entire hospitalization to provide care to that no, no risk group. Or you can collect that same piece of information, but about the group that needs zero to one nutrition interventions at, uh, during their hospital stay. The second piece of information that you need to collect for your facility is you need to understand how many patients are admitted per, I would say, month in each category, either the at-risk category or the not at-risk category, or if you're doing it the other way, based on the intervention count. 
once you have those pieces of information with your facility, you do some multiplication. So um, in the case of the no risk patients, you multiply the number of minutes per patient by the number of patients that you have. And in the case of the higher risk category patients, you use um, the multiplicative factors that we provide in the paper that demonstrated how much additional time those higher risk groups needed. And then you have your number of um, <clears throat> minutes of care time that you would need to provide nutrition care for the number of predicted admissions within, you know, about a month. You then have to um, account for other activities that the dietitian in your facility is doing. And so you need to have an estimate of sort of direct versus indirect care time. Many facilities track this already, and so they can use their customized results or our previous 2015 data suggested perhaps around 50% was accurate. So you want to double the, the number of minutes uh, that you got in the first calculation. And that is sort of the very rudimentary explanation of how you would um, put put this into practice. But hopefully the example in table four helps people to um, put some numbers to that and walks them through an example so that they're confident in in applying this data, which we again, we hope is is practical and helpful. Okay, thank you so much for providing these detailed ideas to RDNs in work settings, um, where this topic will be incredibly important. And the uniqueness, and I think especially the timely relevance of this topic will be of great interest to our Academy membership. Thank you for responding to my questions, and I so appreciate the time you've given to this podcast. Great. Thank you for Thanks. inviting us. Thank you.